and welcome. Again, it's a pleasure to be with you. I know a few are taking care of some other details and they will be back and uh, they'll probably join us partway through this presentation or after it for some of the other presentations. And that's fine, the time is yours. Um, but let us pray as we begin this segment. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your abundant blessings and your goodness to us. And as we discuss the power of food, we ask for you to be our teacher and to lead us and guide us at this time, we pray and thank you for doing so. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> so we're going to be looking at the power of food. And we're going to be looking at three components, very briefly about health, some about um, <coughs> the... Uh, ecological uh, effects of our diet, and then looking at uh, performance and athletics in its relation to um, nutrition and food. Of course, heart disease is the number one killer around the world. Don't know if it will always be that way. We know that cancer is catching up on heart disease, at least in the United States. But what we know about heart disease is that heart disease is reversible. We've got studies from Dean Ornish over in California, from Caldwell Esselstyn at uh, the Cleveland Clinic, and there are more studies from other individuals showing that a, a whole food, plant-based diet in combination with moderate exercise and stress management can actually begin to reverse the plaque uh, development in arteries that individuals already have. In fact, uh, some of the studies show on average 30% reduction of plaque size uh, over 18 to 36 months of being on a whole food plant-based diet. And so heart disease is reversible and it can be reversible in a very easy way and that is simply at your own table uh, or at the tables of others that you eat with and hopefully not too often at the table of the fast food restaurant chain because it's difficult to find things that are good for you that are not going to continue the progression of heart disease if you are eating in a fast food place. So what kind of diet is this diet that reverses heart disease? Well, it's a diet that includes things like fruits and vegetables. It includes whole grains and legumes, which are your beans, peas, and lentils. It includes things like nuts and seeds and, and, and herbs as well. All of these are good components, healthy components of a, a whole food plant-based diet that can help with the reversal of cardiovascular disease. Um, what does it exclude? Well, it excludes animal foods, right? The more animal foods that you consume, the more diseases that you develop, including heart disease. Uh, cholesterol comes from animals, and the more animals you eat, the more cholesterol issues that you end up having. Also animal byproducts. If it, can, uh, if it can run, swim, or fly away from you if you try to kill it and eat it, don't. Right? And, and in general, if it falls out of, squirts out of, or something else out of an animal, that uh, then you'd probably you'd be better off not consuming that as well. Uh, and so, you know, dairy and, and eggs and so on. Um, also, very uh, large sources of cholesterol. Cheese is the biggest uh, source of saturated fats in the American diet. Um, and, uh, and those adverse health effects associated with it. It also includes things like processed foods. Uh, white flour products, sweeteners, oils, fry, fried foods, condiments, and, and so on and so forth. All of these things contribute to uh, disease, contribute to inflammation, contribute to fat uh, accumulation in the body and the, the negative effects associated with that and plaque development and arteries and so on. So yes, we need to eat. Food is a very good thing. God created us to eat, but we need to eat the right stuff. And the right stuff is good. It really is. It, it's, it's good. I mean, I, when we made the change in our diet and our family, wow, I thought I was giving up everything because I was a cheeseaholic and a chocoholic and a few other holics. But, um, you know, I mean, it was, yeah, it was difficult to give up the chocolate, but it was really hard to give up the cheese. 
Uh, there are addictive properties that are there. There's uh, uh, casomorphins um, that are that are in it that you know stimulate. It's almost like a morphine-like effect, um, and morphine can be addicting. And uh, and and it was hard giving those things up. But you know what? I eat good. I eat really good. Um, and it's not because I cook really well, but my wife does, and my children do, and. And uh, so I get to eat really well, and uh, the Lord has blessed me with that, and I'm very happy for it. I, I do not miss all of the things that I used to have before. Now, not only is it heart disease that diet has an impact on, but it's also obesity. This is a map of the United States, and it's, uh, this is 1985, and this, many of the states have not been submitting data at this point. They weren't so good then. And, uh, we'll, we'll see as we go through the years that they so start submitting some more data, but it's looking at obesity, a body mass index of at least 30 or at least 30 pounds overweight for somebody that's five foot four. And the, the light blue areas is less than 10% of the population that is overweight obese, and the darker blue areas, it's 10 to 14%, but notice there's nowhere where it's at least 15% of the population that's obese. Well, that's 1985, this is 1986, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91. Oh, whoops, now we have to add a 15 to 19% of the population category. And uh, of course, we're sitting right next to a couple of those states, Mississippi and Louisiana, that are uh, leading the way. That's 91, this is 92, 1993, 94, 95, 96, 1997, now we have a new category, and again, we're right next to Mississippi, the epicenter of this epidemic. Um, and, uh, and so now we've got at least 20% of the population that is obese. And then we've got 1998, 1999, 2000, 2001, now we have the new category, at least 25% of the population that is obese. And again, the epicenter is still Mississippi. And now Alabama joins right along in 2002, along with West Virginia. And 2003, 2004, 2005. Oh, look, it's like every three to four years, we have to add in another 5% category on obesity. And now at least 30% of the population that's obese, Louisiana, Mississippi, West Virginia leading the way. That's 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009. Notice that there's only one state that's in blue, that's dark blue. That's Colorado. It's hanging on for its dear life. And, oh, it's gone in 2010. So entirely different United States in 2010 as there was in 1985. And uh, they changed some of the criteria, and so they changed the look of the map in 2011, 2012, and now 2013, which is the last map that I have. At least 35% of the population in, uh, looks like Mississippi and West Virginia, is still leading the way. Uh, very interesting, this growth in obesity across the United States. And so you see there's this general trend of increasing weight in individuals over a fairly short period of time. I mean, this is less than a generation. So can we account for this from a genetic standpoint? No, can't count for it from a genetic standpoint. There has to be other things that are going on that can change rapidly over that time frame. And not only is it the obesity, but diabetes follows right on the heels of obesity. And so as that obesity epidemic grows, well, the diabetes epidemic is uh, growing and, can, and is catching along as well. This is a study um, that was looking at the different dietary patterns and the, um, and the, the, uh, the average body mass index, which is an indicator of obesity and so on, uh, amongst the different dietary patterns. And looking amongst thousands of individuals, we see that if you're an omnivore, meaning that you eat, you know, it, it's seafood, right? You see food, you eat the food. So omnivores are uh, carnivores, you know, and, and their average body mass index is 28.8, which is kind of on the upper end of overweight. Then you have semi-vegetarians, which means that they eat meat once a week or less often. 
Uh, and they're at 27.3, so they're mid-range overweight. Pesco vegetarians, the only flesh food that they eat is fish. And they're still on average overweight at 26.3, uh, which is still overweight. Lacto-ova vegetarians, which don't eat any flesh food, but they eat byproducts, eggs, milk, cheese, butter, so on. Um, then they're at 25.7, so the lower end of overweight. And the only category of dietary patterns where the average individual, the average is Normal weight is the vegan category where you're not eating any of the animal pro products or the animal byproducts. Uh, body mass index of 23.6, which is fairly ideal. Uh, so you get to see the idea that uh, just the general trend that the more animals in the diet, the higher the weight tends to be. And then there are lots of complications associated with uh, obesity and overweight. And, and uh, But this lecture is not for the purpose of uh, expounding upon those, just that we recognize there are many diseases and many problems associated with, be, with being overweight and with being obese. Now diabetes. Diabetes is the second leading uh, cause of death in certain nations. In the United States, I think it's somewhere around, I don't know, four or five or so, but it's a huge problem. I mean, it's growing like crazy across the United States. And one of the concerns, one of the big concerns is that, that we we have a huge population of pre-diabetes, pre-diabetics. And the research shows that the majority of pre-diabetics will turn into diabetics and uh, within the next 10 years or so. And that's really scary when it comes to uh, health, but it's also really scary when it comes to finances as well, because the United States, uh, with all of the finances that we can print, Um, we're not going to be able to keep up financially with the costs associated with just diabetes care uh, within the next 10, 15 years or so. That's scary. And diabetes is the leading cause of blindness in the developed world. It's the leading cause of kidney failure with the requirement of dialysis. It's the leading cause of amputations. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's it accelerates that cardiovascular disease that we were talking about, heart attacks and stroke and peripheral vascular disease and erectile dysfunction and so on. And, and most diabetics die from cardiovascular disease. And so this all gets accelerated because of diabetes. And, and what's the best treatment for, for diabetes? It's your food. That's right, it's a whole food, plant-based diet, right? That, that same thing that was beneficial for cardiovascular disease is the whole, is the same thing that is beneficial for diabetes as well. If you can't get in control of the diet when you're diabetic, I don't care how far you run, I don't care how much you exercise, I don't care how, what, you know, you cannot out-exercise a bad diet. You can't. You can't out-exercise a bad diet. You've got to get on top of the diet if you're ever going to get on top of the diabetes or the cardiovascular disease. Well, what about cancer? Is that also uh, in, in part of this game as well? Well, yes, that's part of it as well. We, we see the American Cancer Society eat a healthy diet with an emphasis on plant foods, the World Cancer Research Fund, eat mostly foods of plant origin. The American Institute for Cancer Research choose mostly plant foods such as vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and cut out the sugary drinks. They're, they're all saying eat plants, right? And I, I, I surmise that, uh, that the reason then that they're, that they're not definitely saying don't eat animals is because there's a little bit of financial incentive, like millions of dollars, um, that, uh, that are coming in from cattle and dairy industries and so on uh, that make it a little bit difficult for them to say absolutely no and cut off that funding. So what is, for cancer, what's your best option? Yeah, whole food, plant-based diet, right? That, that is gonna be your best option for cancer. And, and, and when, when we look at centers around the world that are looking at helping individuals to reverse their diseases, I don't know of a single center that includes animal products as part of their treatment plan. Because we just can't reverse disease when you, when you continue including the animal products as part of the diet. Disability and uh, death and disability adjusted life years. We find that the, the largest risk factor for disability and for death uh, in the United States, the largest risk factor is diet. 
used to be smoking. Smoking was number one, but um, uh, thankfully there are more people now in the United States that have quit smoking than, the, than are smoking. Uh, some of that, uh, those millions of dollars that have been going into advertising and so on is making some of a difference. But diet, wow, yeah, it's, it continues to grow and we continue to grow along with it. So a whole food plant-based diet, that's your best choice when it comes to uh, di dietary interventions for dis different diseases in their states. The, the problem is, is not only is it us, it's our planet. Our planet is broken too. We have problems uh, across this world. We've got freshwater shortages right around the world. We're running into major shortages of fresh water. It's estimated that by, by 2030, 40% of all the world's fresh water supplies will be depleted. And that's not too far away. We're, we're, we're right on the heels of 2020. And so we're looking at 11 years from now that, that about 40% of the world's fresh water supplies are going to be depleted. Now, you might not see it right now in your location. You might, it might be flooding. You're looking at it and going, well, how could that be? But around the world, when we look at the trends that are going on as far as water and fresh water supplies, that's the way that this, this world is heading. It's looking like it's going in. Well, we could try to conserve some water, right, and conserve some of that fresh water. Now, the average household uses about 50,000 gallons of water every year directly. Right? That's actual usage of water, and this is... This is uh, water that you're drinking. This is water that you're washing your clothes and your dishes with. This is water that you're watering the garden with, and so on and so forth, right? That, that water uh, intake is, uh, is about 50,000 gallons per household. And so there might be a different ways that you can look at approaching uh, trying to conserve some of that water. And th this is recommendations, I think, I think this came out with California and their whole water crisis over these last several years. Well, one of the ways that you can conserve water is instead of just running the water while you're washing dishes, plug the drain, right? Fill up the, fill up the sink and wash your dishes that way, rinse them and, and so on, but instead of just having the water running the whole time. Turn the water off while you're brushing your teeth instead of having it run the whole time that you're brushing your teeth. Use the dishwasher instead of washing the dishes by hand. Actually, the dishwasher is more efficient when it comes to water usage than, uh, than washing by hand and so on, right? And, and these different methods of helping to conserve, um, to conserve water only save about two to three gallons of water per household per day, right? Of course, if it's water that you're drinking, those two to three gallons of water is important, right? Um, but it's only about two to three gallons a day. Now, let's look at water from a different standpoint, not just the stuff that we wash, not just the stuff that we flush, not just the stuff that we drink, but let's look at water in, uh, in another way, in water that's used to produce what we eat. So how many gallons of water does it take to produce one pound of carrots? All right. Now you've got a cheat sheet, so you can probably tell me right off your cheat sheet. Those of you that don't, you can guess. How many gallons of water for a pound of carrots? All right, six gallons. That's not much. Right? Not much. Six gallons of water for a pound of carrots. That's pretty good. What about a pound of blueberries? All right, so we've got 10 gallons of water for a pound of blueberries. And tomatoes? 28 gallons of water for a pound of tomatoes. All right, we're starting to get a little less, less efficient here. Uh, greens, so like collards and kale and, and so on? All right, so 31 gallons of water for a pound of uh, kale and collards and your other greens. Potatoes? 34 pound, I mean 34 gallons of water for a pound of potatoes and a chicken. Oh, 800 gallons of water for a pound of chicken. Right? Ah, you're like, hang on, how is that? How do, you, well, how, do you, how do you put that much water in a chicken? Well, it's not just what the chicken drinks. 
right? It's also what the chicken eats. So if the chicken's going to be eating corn, then how much water had to go into the corn to make that much corn that the chicken eats? Or how much water had to go into the grain that the chicken ate and so on and so forth, right? So we're looking at about 800 gallons of water for every pound of chicken that you consume. What about for every gallon of milk? Oh, a thousand gallons of water for every gallon of milk that's produced. And again, it's not just what the cow drank, but it was the, all the water that went into the food that the cow ate in order to be able to get to the point of producing the milk and then producing the amount of milk that she, that she makes, right? And producing the calf so that she would have the hormonal balance that she needed to in order to produce um, the milk and, you know, so all of those considerations. Well, what about pork? How many gallons of water for a pound of pork? Oh, 1,500. It's getting worse. And what about our favorite cattle? Oh, all the way up to 4,200 gallons of water for a pound a hamburger, right? Or a steak or, or something like that, right? 1,800 to 4,200. It's the most inefficient. Uh, so far of, uh, of what, we, what we see here of foods that we consume. I mean, a grossly inefficient uh, use of water. And yet, how much of our water do we use for cattle and for the animals that we consume? Well, it's, it's a lot, right? It's a lot. And I'll delay just briefly while somebody's taking a picture. And there we go. All right. So our livestock, they use about 27% of all fresh water around the world. So if our livestock is using about 27% of all the fresh water around the world, but what about the US? We're more efficient, aren't we? Well, it's over 50% of all US fresh water goes to livestock, right? Over 50% of US fresh water goes to livestock. And, and hang on, we're running into fresh water shortages? Right? We're looking at a 40% shortage across the world by, by 2030, but where is, where is a lot of it going? Animals. Yeah, it's going to the animals that we consume. Oh. Okay, so, so what does our consumption of food look like when it comes to then water conservation? Well, an annual household consumes, here in the United States, consumes about 200 pounds of meat a year. That's the average, average uh, person that's a person, about 200 pounds per person per year. And of course, for me who eats zero, then somebody's eating 400, <laughs> right? And you know, you can imagine that that's some, you know, you could do that. I uh, know, never mind, I'm not gonna make any comments. All right, so <clears throat> that represents about 405,000 gallons of water per person per year because that's about how much water it would take to produce the various meats that individuals eat at a consumption of about 200 pounds per person per year. So that's a significant amount of water that an individual is ultimately consuming based upon the food choices that they are making. Isn't that a lot, 405,000 gallons per person? For average household, you just multiply that by the number of individuals in an average household, that's about 1.265 million gallons of water per household per year. Now, what is that compared to 50,000 gallons? Many, many, many times more. Right? So the direct use of water doesn't seem like that much for an annual basis, but from based upon what we eat, and its impact upon water on a planetary basis or a na nationwide basis, that has a significant impact. So if you were looking at water conservation, what would be your biggest method for conserving water? Change what you eat. That's right. Simply changing what you eat will have the biggest impact upon water conservation more so than how you change your di you wash your dishes, much, much more so than turning the water off between uh, brushing your teeth and so on and so forth, it's estimated that with a simple change from cutting out meat and dairy 
and, and switching to a plant-based diet, you're, you're going to conserve over 1,000 gallons a day per, ho per household. That's much more than two to three gallons a day. Right? Over 1,000 gallons a day of water conservation per household. It, much greater impact upon this world. Well, not only is it fresh water, it's salt water too. We've got problems with the oceans. One of the problems is we eat fish. And fish don't like to be eaten. <laughs> uh, I know, we're, we're, we're all about stepping on some people's toes, and that's okay. Um, so, so, well, it, we overfish. That's the problem. It's, it, it's, it's, we are not temperate in our consumption, right? And, and, and with the fishing industry the way that it is, we have already decimated 90% of, of the large fish species out there. Uh, tuna and, <coughs> and, um, and salmon and uh, sea bass and uh, sailfish and you, you name it, right? Those, the large fish species, almost 90% of the populations have been decimated. I'm not saying that all of those species are gone, but their population numbers have decreased significantly because of our fishing. And not only that, but with what we're doing as far as an in industrial nations and uh, pollution runoff and other things like that, there's an acidification of the water that's happening. And that change in pH actually has a significant impact upon life in the, in the sea. And in fact, by now, we've lost about 50% of our coral reefs around the world in the oceans. About half of them gone already. And it's estimated that by 2048, which is coming up fairly quickly, most of us, that's still within our lifetimes, <clears throat> all commercially recognized fish may be nearly extinct and all coral reefs could be gone. And that's really scary because the coral reefs are like the the tropical forests of the ocean. That's where you find the greatest biodiversity. That's where you find, these are the birthing places for many of the different species that are alive in the ocean. This is where, where you have uh, a major center of balance and life in the oceans. And yet it's so dependent upon pH, and it's so dependent upon temperature, and it's so dependent upon so many different environmental factors, and all those environmental factors are really getting messed up now. And, and speaking of, of forests, well, that's another problem. We have deforestation that's going on above ground. And, and how bad is that in our tropical rainforest? Well, it's estimated that we are going to lose 420 million acres of tropical rainforest by 2030. In the next 11 years, we're going to look at losing 420 million acres of rainforest. And that's not good. And <clears throat> so what's causing the loss of the rainforest? Well, since 1970, 91%, how much? 91% of the Amazon rainforest has been lost due to livestock, or crops that are grown to feed to the livestock. So it's either the, it's clearing land for the animals to consume, or it's clearing the land to, to produce food so that the animals might consume. And why are we producing the animals? To eat them. That's right. right. Otherwise, we'd leave, leave them alone. Right. Have, you, have you seen a rat farm lately? Well, not in this country except for a laboratory and uh, experimental places, but otherwise you don't see a rat farm. Now, in other countries you might, because in other places they do consume rats, um, but not here. It, why do we raise the animals? Well, we raise the animals so that we might consume the animals, right? And it's not just the, the Amazon rainforest. There are other rainforests that are out there as well. Uh, it was estimated that back in 2017, the tipping point was reached as far as our rainforests were concerned, and we are now heading downhill 
All right, we are now heading downhill on a pathway that doesn't seem to be very stoppable at this point. By 2023, we're looking at four years, the Borneo rainforest might be gone if it continues at the deforestation rates that they're going already. Um, and Africa, well, Africa has rainforests too. A lot of times we think of it as hot and deserty, but uh, there are tropical rainforests there. And by 2050, they're estimating that most of the African rainforests are gonna be gone and about half of the Amazon by that time. A and again, tremendous biodiversity, tremendous plant life that is that is there. I mean, there's so many different botanicals that we don't even know about that are, that are there that might have different uh, medicinal qualities to them. We might find something there in the jungle if we actually had the opportunity and we got there before it got destroyed. Uh, that might be the cure for this, that, or the other thing. We don't know. And, and so many animals that find their, their lives and their, their, their whole life cycle there in those tropical rainforests. Mm. Well, what about land that doesn't have tropical ran, uh, rainforests? Well, land depletion is an issue as well. Around the world, livestock consumes 45% of the world's land mass. Yeah. So it's, what was it? It was 27% of the fresh water, but it's 45% of the world's land mass. And in the United States, livestock uh, was drinking over 50% of the fresh water. Well, in the United States, it consumes, livestock consumes over 50% of the U.S. land mass. Now, are, are some of us living on U.S. land mass? Yeah, and we don't have livestock consuming our property unless you consider the wild deer livestock, which you wouldn't. Um, so what about our agricultural land? Right? Just take take away just the land mass, but the agricultural land. Well, in the, in the United States, 97% of our agricultural land goes to animals. 97% of what we produce in the United States that is consumed by a living organism goes to animals so that we might eat the animals. That's right. Now, part of it goes to other things. There's biofuel and there's there's, I mean, you can make plastic from soy and, and so on, but for, of that landmass that is going to be consumed by a creature, 97% of it goes to uh, livestock. And the problem is we have a growing population of humans on this planet, and the planet only has a particular size. I mean, we are currently around 7.5 billion people on this planet, and they're estimating that we'll be up to 9 billion, oh, by... Somewhere around 2030, I think, was the estimate, or 2035, somewhere around there, that uh, we should be around 9 billion. And we're having problems. We're having problems with resources and getting resources to places that they're needed. Right. 795 million people in this world do not have enough food to lead a healthy life and an active life. Many are starving to death. Why? Well, because in their part of the world, there's not enough food to keep them alive. And the amazing thing is, is that we have plenty of space on this planet to grow enough food to feed everybody that needs that food. And if we had distribution ways of getting it around, which we do, but a majority of that agricultural land is the food's going directly to animals in a very inefficient way. And then we have food shortages and other problems that lead to some real horrible stuff. I mean, there, around this world, there are many, many, many people that are still dying every day because they're starving to death, even while the rest of the planet is getting fat. Right? <clears throat> so let's consider how much food a one-acre lot can produce over a two-year time frame. So two years, one-acre plot. How much food can you produce of strawberries? How many pounds of strawberries can you produce on a one-acre lot over two years? Yeah, 136,000 pounds of strawberries. I'm like, woohoo! All right, that's like good news to me. I like strawberries, and I like, you know, strawberry smoothies, and I like strawberries, and I like strawberry shortcake, and I like strawberry this and strawberry that, and strawberry the other thing, and even if it's, you know, strawberry ice cream, you know. Um, 
made out of frozen strawberries and some banana and, and uh, oh, good stuff, right? Good stuff. 136,000 pounds. Potatoes? Well, not quite as efficient. 79,400 pounds over two years on one acre. Peaches? Well, we're close. 64,000. We've got a few peach trees on our, on our, uh, on our property. I would love to get 64,000 pounds of peaches off of our trees. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Of course, we don't have them packed all through there. We only have I think eight trees. Um, kale, 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 about 40,000. Collard greens, a little bit less, 28,000. Kale is, oh, I love kale. I didn't love kale before I came here, but I love kale. And, um, and when they plant a nice row, big fat row of kale out there, and during the winter you can go out and just pick, 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 oh. Legumes, your beans, peas, and lentils, well, about 10,000 pounds. Of, uh, of legumes on an acre over two years. Ancient grains, things like quinoa and camut and other things like that, uh, 6,000 pounds. Meat, 100 pounds on average. About 100 pounds of meat per acre over a two year time frame. Just considering, you know, grazing and uh, how much that the animals can consume on that. Uh, on that uh, land, what it can produce so that they can eat and then it can also uh, then turn into the meat that you can consume. So uh, meat consumption is highly, highly inefficient when it comes to energy resources and it's highly, highly inefficient when it comes to water resources as well and when it comes to land resources and so on. And yet around this world, 2015, we consumed as a planet 74 million tons of beef. That's a lot. That's a lot. 130 million tons of pork. We consumed 124 million tons of poultry, 26 million tons of sheep and goat, and 187 million tons of fish or sea life. Right? That's a lot. So we're consuming a lot around this planet. <clears throat> And uh, that's the consumption, but the question is, what about the raising? <laughs> what do the animals go through in this process? Is, is it ethical the way that we, we treat the animals that we consume? Now, it's easy when you don't see them and you're not there in the growing up process and how things happen and, and so on. If you, wanna, if you want a better insight into this, there's a, there's a great... Um, documentary that's free. You can just go online and stream it and watch it. It's called, uh, you go to hope-theproject.com. So hope-theproject.com. And uh, it, it, it's kind of set up in the same way like this. I d actually didn't intend for it to be that way. Maybe it was just by suggestion. Um, and, but anyways, they start off talking about health and the health benefits of a, of a plant-based diet. And then they switch to the uh, the ecological impacts of it, and then they switch into the ethical components of it, and and what happens to your to your animals before they end up on your plate. Well, I mean, thousands of chickens are crammed into large ki chicken broilers, and and given hormones to increase their growth rate. A number of these chickens grow so fast they can't even stand under their own weight. Uh, they're also given antibiotics because living conditions are so bad that infections run rampant and they've got to keep that under control and not infrequently the live chickens are having to walk around on the corpses of dead chickens and all of this because we think we need meat for food. Because right. I've got to get my protein somehow, right? Hmm. Well, many pigs, it's not just the chickens, many pigs are raised in similar situations. They're confined to cages so small that they can't even turn around in their entire adult lifetime. Not even once, not even turn around once. Many lay in their own excrement throughout the day. And when mothers have piglets in these situations, the piglets are soon separated from their mothers. Sometimes the mothers lay on them because they can't get away from them. And there's a little sick one, they can't get to it and, and so on. It's Horrible, horrible. What about the milk you drink? Well, it's produced by cows, 
that are kept perpetually pregnant because they can't produce the milk otherwise. I don't know if you thought about that, what state, uh, developmental state a cow has to be in in order to be able to produce milk. Right? But once they have the baby, well, you can't have the baby stealing the milk. I don't know if you thought about that either. But you can't have the baby stealing the milk. And so within a day to two days after birth, you have to separate the calf from the mother and take the calf off somewhere else. And if there's a need for the calf, well, that's fine. They can raise it and whatever. If there's not, then, well, usually the calf goes on to become hamburger. And, uh, <clears throat> and you can imagine what the mothers are like and how they respond when their newborn calf is separated from them and all the bawling and everything that happens during that time. And, and, and you can imagine maybe the stress hormones that might be going on in mother's body when she's separated from her little one. And then that's going into the, and the milk. That's right, and, and then we're, we're consuming that milk and maybe we get those stress hormones too. Right. Hmm. And uh, the animals that go through these living situations, they're not always healthy. In fact, frequently they're not. Many of them have infections, tumors, other significant health concerns, but, you know, it's business, so they get uh, slaughtered anyways. And that diseased meat finds its way into your table. And we wonder why we have so much cancer. We wonder why we have so much diseases. We wonder why there are so many problems that are going on from the food that we consume. That's the food we consume, right? They're not healthy anymore. <clears throat> sure, back in the day of Jesus, were the environmental conditions slightly different? Yeah, they were. Quite different 2,000 years ago. The environmental conditions are significantly different now. <clears throat> we grew up on a, I grew up in central Florida. There's a lake that we lived on called Pearl Lake. Pearl Lake did not look like a pearl when I was there. Pearl Lake looked like brown. And you could see two, two and a half feet down into the water. Below that, it was murky. You couldn't see below that. But you know why they named it Pearl Lake? Because it used to look like a pearl. Right? It used to be white sandy bottoms. It used to have springs that would flow uh, in it from the aquifer and so on underneath. I, I was at a neighbor's house, and I, and I saw this picture on, on his wall, uh, Grandpa Illick, and, and there's this picture on the wall, and it's this white sandy lake with white edges and clear water and so on, and I, and I asked him, where's that? He said, oh, that's the lake right back there. <laughs> really? That was back from the 50s when he moved into the area, and it was, it was, it was beautiful. Now, to catch a fish and eat it back in the 1950s when it was clean and pure and all that kind of stuff, and to catch a fish and eat it now, when it's all murky and plugged up and, and, and so on, entirely different, right? We don't live in the same world now that was there. 70 billion land animals are raised every year for us to eat, and the majority of them are raised in CAFOs, or concentrated animal feeding operations in conditions that we would think were atrocious if we would go and expect, inspect it for ourselves. I remember going on vacation um, with, uh, with my mom, and we were in Colorado, and we were driving around southern, uh, the, the southeastern part of Colorado, and, and, and you're driving along, and eventually you get to this place, and you just start smelling something. You're like, oh, oh. And turn the air on, recirculate, and oh, oh, roll up the windows. Oh, that's absolutely horrible. This just reeks. <clears throat> and you keep driving along, and then all of a sudden, in this swath of desert like area, you see this big square. And all it is is cattle. And what are the cattle living in? They're on excrement, right? They're, I mean, that's what all that brown is. And where do you have to lay down? Where do you have to play? Where do you have to whatever? And then, of course, that turns into good manure, so you can't get, you know, to, not only do you get to raise the cattle, but then you get to have the manure and, and then 
you know, and then sell them uh, the manure. But what about the cows that live in that? Oh man, it stinks for miles. Uh, all of this system is in place so that we can satisfy our desire for meat. And then there's greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, our planet is suffering under the weight of tons and tons of greenhouse gases being released each year. And these greenhouse gases are eroding our ozone layer. It's leading to significant climate changes around the world. And these climate changes may be seen in fires in one place and floods in another. It may be in hurricanes in one place and natural disasters in another. There's all sorts of different manifestations in different areas because of what's going on. Are we as Christians to be the destroyers or the, 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 the protectors of the planet that God has placed us on? Yeah, we're the protectors, but what are we doing? Right? We focus on the transportation industry and its impact upon greenhouse gases, but the transportation industry is only responsible for about 13% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Only about 13%. But it's estimated that livestock alone accounts for about 14.5% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Ethane is a, is a strong greenhouse gas. And uh, in fact, it's estimated that the maximum load of greenhouse gas emissions that the Earth can sustain will be exceeded by 2050 from livestock alone. Just, uh, not even considering transportation. Even if we go all the way green, when it comes to transportation, we have alternate energy sources and no fuel and no uh, combustible fuels and that kind of stuff. Even if we did that, just from livestock alone, by 2050, we're going to outstrip what this planet can handle as far as greenhouse gases if we continue in the same direction that we're going. And, well, my, I eat free range, <clears throat> right? That's not that cattle farming stuff and whatever. I eat free range. Well, free range is less sustainable than grain fed. It uses more land, produces more greenhouse gas emissions, uses more fresh water, destroys more biodiversity, and has a higher feed uh, conversion ratio. And the research shows little benefit of eating free range compared to eating animals raised in a concentrated animal feeding operation. There's, there's no convincing research that I've found that shows that there's much of a difference between eating one versus the other. But yet it has, a str it has even a higher environmental impact. So we have a problem. You see, we're, we're fatter, we're sweeter, we're lazier, we're sicker, our planet is dying, and we think we need animal protein to be healthy. Where am I going to get my protein? Well, ask an elephant. A rhinoceros, a hippopotamus, or a gorilla, where they get their protein from. Some of the strongest animals on the planet, and what do they eat? Plants. That's right. They eat plants. They get it directly. Well, ask Scott Jurek where he gets his protein from. He's a world record endurance athlete, holding multiple first place finishes and world record times in ultra distance competitions. What does Scott eat? Plants and plants alone. Right? No animal products as a part of his diet, and he blows the competition away. I mean, he, it, it's, it's incredible. All the records that he's sent for, he's, he, has, he has accumulated for all of these long distance, ultra distance, spartal, spartathlons and, and so on that he has, that he has run. Well, Ask Patrick Bamonian where he gets his, plant, his protein from. Right? That guy's big. He's huge. Right? He's considered by some to be one of the strongest men in the world. He has a number of world records in the yoke walk where he carried 1,232 pounds over 30 feet without putting it down. What does he eat? Plants and plants alone. Right? And when he made the switch to plants and plants alone, guess what happened to his strength? It went up. That's right. It went up. You can ask Morgan Mitchell where she gets her protein from. She's a two-time Olympic medalist for the 400-meter race. She gets her, plant, her, 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 her protein from? From plants. That's right. From plants. And she's fast. Right? On plants. You can ask Dotsie Bosch where she gets her protein from. She's an eight-time U.S. national cycling champion. 
the oldest woman ever to make it to the Olympics in her competition. And she's getting her protein from where? From plants, that's right. Kendrick Ferris, he's a American champion weightlifter, holds several championship titles in weightlifting. Where does he get his protein from? from plants, right? Eating plants does not mean that you're a weakling. Eating plants does not mean that you have to be skinny and whatever. Eating plant, it, right? Some of the strongest, biggest animals on this planet, and people too, plants, right? It's healthier. Now, <clears throat> what about smarts? You know, we're talking about athletics, but what about, what about brains? Well, research shows that students who consume more fruits and vegetables and eat breakfast regularly are smarter and perform better on academic tests than their peers. Right? The more plants you consume, the better you can concentrate. The less uh, hyperactivity that children have, <clears throat> the better performance that they have, the better that they get along. It's interesting some of the studies that some, or some experiments that some school systems have done in ridding the school of junk food and soft drinks and so on and putting water and fruit juices and, and switching to a predominantly plant-based diet and what they have seen as far as a transformation of their school and the students and how they behave in their academic performance. It's, it's just incredible. And if we compare uh, our anatomy with other animals and what they consume, <clears throat> we find that our anatomy actually meets with a frugivore. <laughs> That's the closest thing that we're, we're to. So, you know, eating things like fruits and whole grains and nuts and seeds and, and, and so on. We weren't meant so much to chew on bark and, and branches and, and uh, you know, thick leaves and other things like that. But, you know, fruits and vegetables and grains and so on. <clears throat> That's the anatomy that we have. It, it matches. So eating animals leads to heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer. It, it causes water shortages, deforestation, uh, insufficient land usage with resulting starvation, cruelty to animals, increased greenhouse gas emissions with climate change, to name a few. But eating plants leads to disease reversal, better fitness better academic performance, water conservation, efficient land usage with conservation of food resources, compassion towards animals. It decreases greenhouse gas emissions, and it's associated with good climate change. Okay. So what can you do? The single behavioral change that each person can participate in to make the most dramatic impact upon our planet and the life on it is... Stop eating animals and their byproducts. And eat plants, right? And the closer it is to how it grows, the better it is for you. Now, we could have bypassed this whole presentation and we could have just cut it down to one simple slide. Genesis 129, and God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. And if we just paid attention, and we would have eaten where God told us to eat, we would have an entirely different planet, and an entirely different health situation now than what we find ourselves in. So my question to you is, is it time? Is it time to take up that, that admonition that God had for us at the beginning and, and to begin to make that our reality now? So that not only will we have the personal benefit of health, but also that there may be a benefit to our dying planet so that we don't continue contributing in the ways that we have to the death of this planet and all the chaos that goes along with it. I think it's time to take up the power of food and to use it 
All right. There are about four minutes. So are there any questions? If not, I'm going to pray, and we'll have about a 20-minute break. If there are, then in five minutes I'll pray, and we'll have a 15-minute break. Yes. All right, so the question is what exactly do the, what kind of proteins do these uh, athletes use in order to keep the weight on and so on? Um, your highest concentration of proteins from a plant based source is beans, peas, and lentils. So you really have to concentrate on the legumes. Right? Uh, as far as your, uh, your main source of uh, protein content, every plant food that is a whole plant food has protein in it. Right? Every plant food does. Oranges have protein, apples have protein, carrots have protein, cabbage has protein, broccoli has protein, and so on. Right? Every plant food that's a whole plant food has protein in it. Now, if you process it and you turn it into white flour or you turn it into a, a highly processed, uh, only carbohydrate, fiber-free type of product, then you can process all the protein out of it. Um, but every whole plant food has protein in it. And if you are eating a whole food plant-based diet and you are getting a sufficient amount of calories to live, then you will have a sufficient amount of uh, protein in order to live by. Now, the question that many individuals have is like protein um, matching, you know, so, all right, so you're, you, you have your beans, peas, and lentils, which might be missing one uh, essential amino acid, but you have your whole grains that are, that have that essential amino acid, and, but they're missing some others, and so if you put your, your beans, peas, and lentils together with your whole grains, then you have a complete protein. Well, <clears throat> looking at the nutrition industry and recommendations that are coming now, you don't need a protein match, right? And you don't need to match it in a single meal, and you don't even need to match it in a single day. All you have to do is eat a variety of whole plant foods in season, and you will get complete proteins, right? You will, the, there, there are a few locations where you find protein malnutrition, and usually you find protein malnutrition in, uh, in countries where the only food source that individuals have is typically rice, and a processed rice. Uh, and so they're missing a, 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 an essential amino acid, and then they have a protein deficiency. Or if you have individuals that have uh, a significant malabsorption issue. So they might have an inflammatory bowel disease or some other malabsorption issue where they have a difficulty with uh, digestion or absorption of those proteins. <clears throat> and then you can see a protein malnutrition in some of those individuals. But on a whole food plant-based diet, just eating a variety of whole foods on a, on a regular basis as they're in season, no protein deficiencies. Now, some of these individuals I don't know, like the weightlifter, Kendrick, um, he might be using a protein shake, right, with pea protein or soy protein or something else like that that's a protein base that he might be adding to it. I'm not exactly sure. I know some athletes do. There are concerns about overdoing proteins even when it's plant proteins because overdoing even plant proteins can have a, a, a detrimental effect on the kidneys. Animal proteins, about twice as much so. So for the same amount of animal protein versus plant protein, you usually have about twice as much of the kidney damage uh, from that protein content uh, from having high protein intake um, than you do with plant proteins. But you can still overdo the plant proteins as well. Uh, so that's uh, a, a concern as well. Um, so how many calories a day? Well, it depends on the individual and your activity levels and so on. We don't count calories. <clears throat> what we're just doing is we're looking at individuals and saying eat a healthy diet, you know, a healthy meal. When you feel satisfied, stop eating, right? <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and if you're full, you probably ate too much. And if you're stuffed, you definitely ate too much. Uh, so stop when you're satisfied. 
and eat your next meal at least five to six hours later. And uh, we'll get more into those nutrition components and so on as we go on through this week. Um, but uh, our five minutes are done. I'm going to pray. And if you've got a few more questions afterwards, I'll be, I'll be here. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your abundant blessings and your good mercies to us. We ask for you to draw us ever closer to you and work out your abundant will and way. Thank you that you have provided us good food. And Lord, may we choose that good food that we might have the good results of it. And uh, not only be blessed, but be a blessing as well, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>